that a friend of mine is going through right now and I'm just I'm not going to name names or anything but God knows all about the situation if you wouldn't mind just praying for that unspoken request tonight I know that every prayer that goes up for that need is going to be appreciated if no one else has oh sister Melania I have a very special unspoken request that God needs to intervene very quickly well, we need to remember these needs also that are on the screen tonight. We need to remember Roy Boyce, who's struggling with COVID, Sister Jenny's father, who has severe heart issues, Kenny Burns, who has cancer, Doug Seaball, who needs continued recovery, Sister Beulah, we need to continue to pray for her health needs, continue to remember Anthony Sifford as he's um, as he's been healing all along, but he still needs healing of his swallowing function. Specifically, we need to remember Darla Crane, who is having precautionary treatments for cancer. We need to remember that um, our community needs to know the truth. They need to start to desire to hear it and also to have revelation that it is, in fact, the truth and to accept it. And I believe that that can happen. Do you believe that that can happen? Do you believe that that is happening? Yes. Amen. We need to remember our prodigals. We need to remember for, pray for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost, even in this room tonight. I know there are people in this room who had the Holy Ghost for many years, but we need the Holy Ghost every single day. We need to be renewed in it every single day. And I know there's probably people in this room who maybe have never experienced the Holy Ghost. And... Let's just pray that God will begin a work in their heart that maybe sometime soon that they would get to experience what that Holy Ghost is all about. All right, if nobody else has any other needs, we're going to go ahead and pray. Yes. Okay. Laney has RSV, if you don't care to call out her name to the Lord tonight. Nobody else has anything. We're going to go ahead and take our needs before him right now before we go and split off into our classes. We'll go ahead and pray for our classes as well while we're praying that everybody would be blessed in those classes by the word. Nobody else. All right, let's take our needs before him right now. 
Lord, we praise you tonight. We thank you for another chance to just assemble together, God. We know that there's power in unity, God, and we believe for one thing, one cause, God, in your presence, Lord. We pray right now, God, for every need tonight that was unspoken. Lord, you know all about that need, Lord. You know the depths of it, God. You know what needs to happen, and you know the outcome, Lord. And I pray right now that you would give peace and comfort in the middle of the storm, God, whatever it might be. Lord, in the name of Jesus, God, I pray right now that you would just begin to work, begin to move mountains, God, begin to part waters, God, that the, the answers could come, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. I pray right now, God, for every need of health, God. I pray for every person who is sick in their body right now, Lord. I pray that you would begin to touch their body. God, that you would do continued recovery, God, for these people who've been dependent on you for so long, God. I know that you are able to work a miracle in anybody's body, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we ask God because we know that you are able. In the name of Jesus, God, I pray right now, Lord, for every person, God, that's in this room tonight, God. I pray whatever their need might be, God, whatever it is that they might have brought into this place, Lord, maybe it's a need that they don't even realize that they have yet, God, but I pray that you would begin to work on their behalf, Lord. I pray that every person would be touched tonight, God, by your word, by your spirit, God, that no person would leave this place tonight the same way that they came in, God. In Jesus' name, Lord, I pray that you would just begin to move, Lord. Pour out of your spirit, God, in this room right now, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I pray that you would touch every prodigal's heart, God, every person who you are, God, and maybe they've gone astray, Lord. I pray that you would just work in their mind, Lord. I pray that you would help them to become closer to you tonight. In Jesus'
in your life that you can look back on and say, uh, I remember when I got quote unquote saved. Or I remember that time I went to the altar and gave my heart and my life to Jesus Christ. Um, very seldom is there a person um, that does not at some point in their life have what we call a come to Jesus moment. Um, now I know there's people that claim to not believe in God and all that kind of thing and uh, they usually waver in that belief uh, when they get right down to the end. Now there's exceptions to that but um, deep down um, there's something in us that knows um, that there's a God. There's just something we, we may try to unlearn it. Maybe uh, people around us will uh, teach us differently and we'll accept that but it's still there. It's a God-sized hole uh, that's in our heart, in our life, and we can't really fill it up with anything else successfully. We try. We try, but we can't. And the sooner that we realize our need of God, the better off we're going to be. <coughs> Amen? Because once we realize our need of God and our need of relationship with Him, everything else in our life begins to, um, maybe sometimes slowly, but it will surely begin fall into place, and uh, when you understand your purpose uh, in life as a worshiper of God, as a servant of God, it just makes everything else a lot more uh, simple and easier to deal with. So we're not just interested in having, a, as a pastor, I'm not just interested in leading people to that come to Jesus moment, or should I say, even taking advantage of someone's come to Jesus moment, because um, that can happen somewhere besides the church. Uh, but of course, when someone has that come to Jesus moment, the church is here. We're ready to to reel you in, so to speak, and we want you to be a part of of our uh, local church family. But there's more to it than that. There's more to it than uh, shaking the preacher's hand. There's more to it than um, than just a one time uh, connection with God. But we must stay connected. We must come to Jesus, and then figure out how do we. Stay with Jesus, because when you come to Jesus, um, that's when all of hell will begin to come against your life. You know, you might you might think, well, um, you know, why am I having all these problems? I, I thought life was going to get better when I started serving the Lord, and instead all this stuff started happening. Well, that's because the enemy uh, wasn't concerned as long as he had you under wraps, but when you start trying to do what's right, then at least for a period of time, you're going to have an unbelievable amount of pressure and overwhelming factors coming at you from all angles, and you have to push through that. You can't do that on your own. You can't do that in your flesh. You must be connected with the God that you came to to ask for help. Okay, so you can't walk out those doors and um, and and not uh, develop your own personal walk with God. Thank God for the building. Thank God for the fellowship of the saints, but there's sometimes they're not going to be there for you. And there's sometimes pastors going to disappoint you. And there's sometimes it's just going to come down to whether or not uh, you are uh, personally intertwined with the will of God in such a way that the enemy cannot, um, cannot unentangle you from the presence of God. But that's up to you to to work on that and, and get to that point. So that's what we're talking about. We've been talking about staying connected to God. And the first way that we do that is we develop a lifestyle of prayer. And that doesn't just happen. That's why we use the word develop. It means you got to put some effort into it. you got to figure out how that works for you. you got to figure out, um, you know, whenever I was a kid, um, there was people that said, you know, if you didn't pray an hour a day, come to the prayer room an hour before the service, you know, you weren't, you weren't uh, doing well, you weren't uh, living for God like you should, um, uh, but I found out as I went along that prayer is important, but it's not a form of godliness that we're after, but it is the power of relationship with God, and if so that can't be uh, manufactured, yeah, you can develop good habits, corporate prayer is good, but just, just saying that you spend an hour in the prayer room, that may not get it done. I remember as a little child, mm -hmm. I remember as a little child, you know, children, uh, there's not much you get past a child. I mean, it's, uh, they they can pick up on things. 
And I remember as a little child, and I know that people were there uh, sincerely and trying to please their pastor and so on and so forth, okay? Um, but it was required at that time, at that place, that you be in the prayer room for one hour before church. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't want to get sidetracked too much here, but I, I feel like I need to say this. And, um, but as a kid, I remember being in the prayer room, and I heard a whole lot of, thank you, Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, for one hour. Because the truth was, it didn't really take all that long for people to say what they needed to say and to connect to God, but bless God, we want to be here for an hour, we're not spiritual. And so actually, it devolved into vain repetition, you know, and, uh, and I think also a, a misunderstanding of what it means to pray. We talked about this a little bit uh, last week, um, spending time in God's Word. When you come to the prayer room or you get to church early, it's just an important part to uh, maybe spend some time meditating upon the Word of God. We talked about this last week. Right. Read the Word, ingest the Word, meditate upon the Word, and all that is part of your prayer life. So, just as uh, someone said, uh, uh, you know, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. It's the same way with prayer. Sometimes words are not uh, the order of the day or the hour, but it is simply when you establish that connection mm-hmm. with God, then you want to spend time in His presence. And so we don't pray uh, with just vain repetition. We're not just trying to fill up a, a certain block of time, but we are trying to connect and stay connected to God. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember Brother Steve uh, sitting back there tonight. Um, uh, I got acquainted with him. Uh, and acquainted is really the wrong word, but everything starts out as an acquaintance, right? But um, when I was, I guess, 12, 13, 14 years old, somewhere in there, probably 12, um, when Brother Steve came to this area to be a music director, and I was uh, a kid in that local church, in that youth group, and I remember him telling me way back then um, regarding prayer that you pray until you touch God. When, you, when somebody asks you how long should you pray, pray until you touch God. Sometimes I can do that in five seconds. That don't mean I quit praying after five days. I'll say sometimes it's easy to get into the presence of God. Other times you've got a lot of things weighing in, a lot of distractions, and it, and it takes work to get to that place. So it's not a simple thing of just saying, okay, I'm going to pray X amount of time. I'm going to put my time in. You've got the wrong attitude already toward prayer. All it is is staying connected uh, to God. Uh, My wife and I, we have been married for um, 20, I guess going on 27 years. And um, we have been around each other so much and working from home for great parts of that time and for the last um, decade or so she's been working uh, out of the home with me and um, we just spend so much time together that we can drive down the road we can be on a trip or whatever and we may drive for 30 minutes and never say a word to each other mm-hmm. okay um, no problem we're not mad at each other you think anything to say right now we're all talked out and lo and behold, I know I've told you guys this before, some of you believe this, some of you didn't, but people that have been with us, they can witness to this. We can be driving down a road in total silence, and all of a sudden, both of us break out into a song. In the middle of the song, because we were thinking the song in our head, we were singing right. silently, Amazing Grace, whatever. And lo and behold, if we don't both say, that say, they're exactly the same time, you know, the same line. Uh, what is that? That is just being connected with one another, being around each other, knowing each other. I don't know how to explain it, but that's the way it is with God. I don't have to pray all that. I didn't mean to come and reteach my lesson from the last uh, couple weeks ago, but um, but I don't have to be actively praying all day to be connected to God. I can operate in the attitude and the spirit of prayer throughout my day. That's what God's after is for us to stay connected to Him. And so these are ways we do it. Develop that prayer life. Read his word, even if it's just a couple of verses a day. Start somewhere. Read his word. Uh, The world could not hold all the devotional books that have been written, so 
If you can't think of something yourself to keep you in the Word, just buy a devotional book, the 365, the one for every day, and, um, and just read a chapter a day, go through a devotion a day that will help guide you through it. And this puts the framework in place in your life to where it's easy for God to talk to you, communicate with you, uh, and be involved in your everyday life, not just on Wednesday evening or on Sunday when you come to church with a uh, gathering with the rest of the believers. So um, we talked about last week meditating on the Word of God. And uh, we talked about how that meditation is something misunderstood when it comes to um, biblical meditation because the word meditation we use in our society is a totally different kind of thing. It's a it's an emptying out of your mind. You're, you're trying to get your mind completely empty. Um, but with meditating on the Word of God, we're actually trying to fill our mind up with the things of God, yeah. thinking on those things that are true and lovely and are of good report, things that are virtuous and praiseworthy. That's what we're doing. And uh, so before we go on to our final piece of this lesson, I just want to um, uh, share a couple things with you about meditating on the Word of God, um, creating some um, good habits, uh, following some tips that will help you, because we, we live in a very busy, fast-paced society, and that forces us basically to live in a constant uh, frenzied mode. Like right now, I was just, I was just um, uh, helping my soul out with a confession a little bit before church. Sister Beth and Sister Chloe came in uh, a little bit early so there was nobody else here yet and I was just chatting with them and we were talking about the Christmas show and how, how fast the tickets have been selling out and everything and, and I see you now I feel a little guilty because right now it seems like that's just taking way too much of my time. You know, just staying on top of all the aspects of it um, and knowing that it's coming up and that, that's the way life is in general. If it's not the Christmas show then after that it's going to be Christmas and then right. it's going to be something else. Then it's going to be, you know, plotting the course of a new year. And so there's all kinds of things, even good things, that can crowd out our relationship time with God. And, um, and in this world that we live in, every day of your life is a challenge in and of itself. So to be able to fit in a time to really connect with God can be difficult, but you can implement some simple practices to make that time of meditation on the Word of God more meaningful. So here's a few tips I, I wanted to share with you. First of all, you need to create a consistent time and place that you're going to spend time with God. Um, something that really, really affected me. Uh, I was talking to a minister friend of mine, um, oh, I guess it was about five years ago, and um, he didn't know that God was speaking to me through him. He was just stating, he was just stating what was in his heart and what someone else had shared with him. He said, he said, you know, if you can't, if you can't say where you pray and when you pray, you don't have a prayer life. Mm -hmm. Why don't you think about that? If somebody asks you about your personal devotion, and you can't tell them a place and a time that that happens on a regular basis, then you don't have a prayer life. Now, that don't mean you don't pray, but it means that you're lacking consistency. And folks, I lived into my 40s, even pastoring a church, and there was times in raising a family and working a secular job and trying to do all these things at the same time, just being transparent with you, that I could not have told you this is my consistent prayer life, prayer time. I'm talking, I'm a preacher. I've been preaching since I was 16 years old. Uh, but I went through a phase in my life where prayer was just, okay, I got 10 minutes in the car and nobody's with me. You know, if that's all you got, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not throwing shade at you. I'm just saying that it's better if you can develop a time and a place of consistency to where your life is not boxing the voice of God out and where you can really stay connected to him. And 
now that I have been able to establish that pattern, okay, um, I've noticed a big difference. I've noticed a big difference in, in, in how that I prepare to preach. Uh, it just every part of it uh, is, I describe it as living in the overflow, and you can't make that happen unless you just uh, are consistent with it. So um, intentionality helps us establish a pattern and more easily enter into our time with God. So if you have that time set aside um, for God, a sacred time and place, um, then it's easier to remove potential distractions so you can focus <laughs> on God. Um, the second thing, of course, is begin, when you meditate on the Word of God, begin that time with prayer. Ask God to open your heart, your understanding that what you're uh, about to read from His Word that it will speak to you the way that he desires uh, for that to happen. We want to think on God and connect with him throughout our day, but ideally uh, we will have a specific point in our day for concentrated time with God. And when we begin that time with prayer, it prepares us for a time of silent, uh, reflective uh, meditation. Okay, so thirdly, um, eliminate distractions. Don't be discouraged when you start trying to practice this as your lifestyle if distractions and other thoughts begin to pop into your mind. Maybe it would help you to keep a notebook or something handy or the little thing post-it notes or something. And whenever you are dedicating yourself to this, saying, okay, I'm committing myself to this personal time with God daily. Uh, for some people, it may have to be 5 o'clock in the morning. Other people, it may be at 11 o'clock at night. I don't know. But whatever it is that works for you, find that still time, that quiet time, uh, set that up, com commit to it, and then make note of the things that invade that time that, you know, as we talked about last week, it may be this right here, okay? You may not be able to
So uh, it is cultivating a commitment to worship. Worship is not Hallelujah. That's praise. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you can worship while you're praising, but it's kind of like a coin. You know, a coin uh, is always a nickel. I mean, a nickel is always a coin, but a coin is not always a nickel. Okay. So, worship always involves praise, but praise does not necessarily always make it to the level of worship. So, as Pentecostals, um, those of you that have been in this for a long time, you can go through church service and go through all the motions and not even know what happened. You know when to say amen. Um, you, you, know, you know when to clap your hands. You know when what's appropriate when. And you can just blend right into a service. If I can't get an amen, how about no me? Right. We can do it. We can. And uh, this is the equivalent of my wife trying to have a conversation with me when my brain's somewhere else. And I'll say, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, uh -huh. and, she, and a little bit later she's like, you didn't hear where I said it. <laughs> and I said, well, no, I heard all of it, I just already forgot. <laughs> and so we have some of those services that are in one ear and out the other and never even registers and affects our lives uh, on a daily basis because we're just giving God perfunctory praise um, because it's just what's going on. But a commitment to be a worshiper, that is a lifestyle. That is a lifestyle that you have to cultivate and you have to uh, work on. So finally, I'm going to get to some scriptures here. Um, I have somebody out there that has Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21 through 24. Who has that? Okay, okay just a second here, and I'm going to have you read that. Um, our relationship with God is... Um, you actually have that one, don't you? Okay, you have chapter 5. You oh, have five. chapter 4. Okay. Um, our relationship with God is characterized by devotion or worship to Him. And every part of our lives should reflect how He has transformed us and should give honor to Him. We demonstrate this worship in our words to Him, in our decisions, and in our conduct. So read that for me. Sister, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21. And in fact, let's read the first two verses and we'll talk about it a little bit. Okay. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye have put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Okay. So if we have believed on Jesus, what should we do away with? Okay. Let's look at this. What should we do away with when we believe on Jesus? Verse 22 tells us. He said, you put off the former conversation. The old man, why? Because that old, that old man, that old lifestyle is corrupt because I was living according to deceitful lust. In other words, whatever that my flesh desired, the, the message of the world, if it feels good, do, uh, feels good, do it. Um, you only have one life to live, so you know, please yourself. Um, that is the message of the world. But he said, you're going to put that off, the former conversation, the old man. Now, somebody give me the definition, 2023, conversation. When I say conversation, what do you think? Okay, no, the word conversation, definition. Conversation. Conversation. Communication. Okay. Conversation. Communicating. Speech. Now, let me give you the King James English definition of conversation. The word conversation in the King James English of that time, it meant your the totality of your conduct. So not just your words, but your conduct. Your as a whole, yeah. your actions, not just words, but your deeds as well, is your conversation. He said, so you're going to put off all those things that were corrupted by your flesh. You are adopting a brand new wow. lifestyle. All right. And so what should we do instead? Um, that will be in the next verse here. What should we do instead? Read 40, verse 23 and 24. Yeah. 
All right, so instead of, of living that old lifestyle, he said, here's what you're going to do now. You put off that old conversation, that old conduct. Now you have new conduct. And that new conduct is marked by being renewed in the spirit of your mind. Hello, you can't do that if you don't pray, if you don't read your Bible, if you don't meditate on the Word of God. That's how we're renewed in the spirit of our mind. So those other three things we talked about, what do they take? They take commitment. They don't just happen. I'm telling you, raised in church. Don't remember the first time I felt the presence of God. I can't tell you when was the first time you felt God's spirit. I can't tell you. I was I was probably under a church pew. I was probably asleep during the preaching and woke up and went to the altar and cried and prayed because I felt God. But I don't remember the first time that happened. God was just always there. I was always in that environment. But to have a personal relationship with God. And now, folks, if we're not careful, we'll be satisfied with just being around his presence. You know, just being able to feel God. That's enough for us. But if we're going to be connected to God and, and have his presence lead us and guide us, we're going to have to be committed to that. So committed to prayer, committed to the word, committed to thinking upon the word. So that I'm renewed in the spirit of my mind. When I do that, I'm putting on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. One scripture says, um, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, it's just like in your mind when you, when you read those words, it's like just putting a coat on, you know. Another place it says, put on the whole armor of God. So, you know, don't go through your day naked spiritually. You've got to put something on. You've got to clothe yourself in righteousness. It's an effort. Okay? Um, can I say this? Can I say this? If we're not careful, we'll be Southeast Missouri Walmart Christians. You know what the difference is between Walmart in Texas and Walmart in Missouri? In Texas, they get dressed to go to Walmart. They actually get dressed. They don't just go in their pajamas. All right? So if we're not careful, we will be Walmart Christians. In other words, we're not putting forth any effort. We're just kind of existing. Oh, it's too much effort to pray. Too much effort to read my, read my Bible. And spiritually, we're just like the, the person who um, just crawls out of bed in their pajamas, doesn't comb their hair, brush their teeth, and they just head right on to Walmart and start doing the shopping. Now, I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm just, that's just observation. Um, we went to, we went on vacation in Texas a few years back uh, in the San Antonio area. We went to this Walmart. Um, I said, what is it about this Walmart? There's something different about this Walmart. And my wife said, well, what is it? I said, look, everybody, they're all dressed up like they're going somewhere. So anyway, I moved across the line there. <laughs> All right. So be renewed in your mind, in the spirit of your mind. Put on the new man. So it's effort, which after God is created in righteousness and holiness. Uh, okay, read for us, Brother Poole. You know, Ephesians chapter five, verse fifteen through twenty. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. Because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and to the Father of the name in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's some good scripture right there. So how can we walk wisely and understand the will of the Lord? That's what our goal is. Well, verse 18 begins to tell us. Be not drunk with wine. That was my old lifestyle. Okay? Um, we're in his excess. But he said, but be filled with with the Spirit. Right. So don't be overcome with the things
deeds of the flesh. Mm -hmm. But go ahead and be inebriated. Go ahead and be saturated. Go ahead and be taken over. But not by that, right. but by the Spirit of God. Right. Okay? Be filled with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And anything that is filled with spiritual fullness is in a state of overflowing. I talk about living in the overflow. Right. Okay, so when you... Um, um, whenever you are full of the Holy Ghost, then it's just like putting that um, glass under the under the faucet and turning it on, and you just don't turn it off. It's really get completely full, and then what happens? It just starts running down the side. And if you if if it's doing that, it's keeping the outside clean. It's keeping the inside fresh, right? right? Because it's a continual supply, that's and that's being filled with the Spirit, being in a state of overflow. How do you do that? How do you get in the spirit? Speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord and giving thanks. This is the stuff that we do at church, but it's not just for church. You don't have to have a band playing. Speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. One of the psalms actually says, let the saints of God be joyful let them sing aloud upon their beds. Right. So this is meant for home. This is meant whenever I go to bed at night and I, I'm thinking before I go to sleep, I'm thinking on that scripture or that uh, that time I spent with the Lord and I'm reflecting on my day and maybe a song just kind of begins to well. He said, just go ahead and sing your song. What is that? That's the overflow of God's presence. Now, right. your spouse may not care too much for that if you, uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning, you decide you're going to sing a song. <laughs> Um, while you're laying there in bed, say, "Hey, I need to get some sleep here." So then you say, well, "You're a distraction. I gotta, I gotta eliminate you." No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but um, these are the things. Unfortunately, a lot of this worship stuff we relegate it to church, where it's an atmosphere of praise and the congregation is the same. But to really have a relationship with God, I need to take church home with me. I need to take what I'm what I'm experiencing at church, and it's okay when I'm driving down the road in my car to uh, put on some gospel music, sing along with it, right. keep my mind on things that are beneficial and keep me in a place that God uh, can speak to me. Now you say, you know, Pastor Martin, this all sounds super spiritual. Is this what you? No, I don't do this all day long. I don't all day long, you know, have the radio on, listen to gospel music, and then this. No, I'm not trying to paint a super spiritual picture for you uh, that is something that does not exist in my life. I'm talking about you have to have some time that you regularly do this. Okay, I'm not saying that you have to uh, go around singing all day long. Uh, but I'm saying that you have to commit yourself to this lifestyle and make room for it or else uh, your spirituality will only be uh, relegated to what happens right here in this building. And I want you to repeat this after me. That, that is, is not, not enough. enough. You know why it's not enough? Because the devil don't work two days a week. The devil don't take vacation. All right? Um, the enemy of your soul, uh, he's on the job. He's very organized, and he's, he's intent on destroying your life every single second of the day. And so you can't afford to be a part-time Christian because he's not a part-time devil. All right. So, um, you know, he don't have to, he doesn't give up just because he wasn't successful today. We would probably give up if we pushed this button, that button, and we couldn't get anything to work. But not the devil. He just keeps pushing buttons. And if he accidentally comes across one, and, and I tell people this all the time too, the devil doesn't know you. said, the devil probably doesn't know me. But he knows somebody like me. Did you hear what I just said? Mm -hmm. Alright. He may not know me personally, but 
he, he's dealt with other people that are my personality type that have the same buttons that I have, and he's been pushing those buttons for over 6,000 years. So all he's got to know, he don't have to know you personally, he just has to know, well, Steve, this is what his, this particular personality type, this is their weakness, this is what uh, right. will work with them, this is the button that I push, and the kingdom of darkness is very organized, and so, um, you know, evil spirits that are working um, alongside Satan and his kingdom, uh, you've certainly dealt with some of those imps at some point in your life, and uh, they uh, know what buttons to push, okay? So you cannot be a part-time Christian. You've got to cultivate a daily commitment uh, to uh, living for God. When Abraham went to Mount Moriah to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, okay, because God said, go and offer him. Now, this is the promised child. This is the one that he believed for for all these years. And God gave him and Sarah this miracle child whenever, uh, you know, they're 100 and, and uh, she's 90 and, and they're barren. And God works a miracle. And they have this child in their old age. And this is the promised child that all the nations of the world are going to be blessed out uh, through this child. And then God says, I want you to go offer him as a sacrifice on a mountain that I will show you. Okay? So, um, you can believe for promises, receive promises, but you can't keep those promises alive unless you're a worshiper. And I don't, this is not my notes. I don't know where that just came from except from the Lord. But, but if you're going to keep <coughs> the promise alive, then you're going to have to be a worshiper. And so whenever they got everything together and they, they're walking to the mountain, and they've got the servants with them and everything. They get to a certain point, and Abraham says, you guys stay here. I and the boy, we're going to go yonder, and I'm going to offer him as a sacrifice, and I'm going to kill him. That's not what he said. He said, we're going to go worship. And he says, and then we're going to come to you again. So he didn't know what was going to happen, but he just knew he was committed to be a worshiper. And when you're living your day-to-day -day life, there are things that you cannot prepare adequately for. You can't save enough money to insulate yourself against financial disaster. Trust me, I've been there. You cannot do it. Uh, it just takes one cancer diagnosis uh, to uh, eat up all your insurance and whatever, whatever you have. It just takes one protracted hospital stay. It just takes one catastrophe in your life to do away with everything that you work for all that time. Okay? Right. So you can't do it on your own. Right. But if you're committed to be a worshiper and you're living the lifestyle worshiper, then you don't have to have all this figured out. Okay? Right. You can have faith in God to say, we're going to go worship and we don't know how this is going to turn out, but I know right. that God's faithful and I know we're going to come back again mm -hmm. somehow. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I know that it's going uh, to work out because I am a worshiper of God. So, uh, so important that we just uh, make sure that we um, cultivate this in our life, a commitment to worship. I realize I'm over time here. Um, but there are practical things that we can do uh, to walk in the ways of God. And those practical things are what we've been talking about. Develop that lifestyle of prayer. Spend time daily in God's Word. Meditate daily on God and His Word and cultivate your personal commitment to worship. Would you stand with me? We don't want to relegate that term worship to a style of music or a portion of the church service where we express our love for God. Those things are good. But Scripture calls the growing Christian to a more robust commitment to worship and intentional act day by day of honoring God in our conversation. That means in all of our words, thoughts, and conduct, and that's what Paul was stressing to the church at Ephesus here, to be filled with God's Spirit so that we can walk in ways that honor or worship this God who has graciously redeemed our lives. I think we should just pray a prayer of commitment right now before we go home tonight. And, and start, if, maybe you start out in just some small way, but every person here can implement some change, okay? That going forward, you can build off of that to strengthen your personal relationship with God. 
your personal walk with God. If you'll do that, God will honor that. And he's going to become stronger in him. So I want you to think of something right now that you can do. Okay? Maybe it's um, I'm going to get up 30 minutes early and this is what I'm going to do at that time to set it aside for the Lord. Um, maybe that's what it looks like. Uh, maybe it has to do with um, your commitment to reading and studying the word and how you're going to go about that, your personal time of devotion. But there's something that each one of us knows that we can do to get on the right track here and cultivate this commitment. So I want you to pray that right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word that has the power to change us if we will just allow you, God, the room, the space in our lives to work. And I just pray right now for every person in this class that we would take what's been taught these past few weeks to heart and that we would make time for you in a way that maybe we haven't been doing. Maybe we've just been kind of haphazardly just kind of doing the best with whatever leftovers that we have. But God, we want to give you our very best. We want to commit ourselves to growing in you. And we know that out of that is going to come an overflow that will bless others and will keep our lives on a sure foundation. I pray for each person, Lord, that they would take that one area and they would begin to go forth in a new commitment from this night forward. And I give you praise and glory for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Uh, don't forget a service on Sunday.